Get your Bibles. We're going to turn to the Gospel according to Luke once again, chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. The Gospel according to Luke, chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. Scripture reads there in Luke chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. He says, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak thou to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns, and I will build greater. And then will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. So take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you this evening. We thank you again for another time that we can gather together to worship you and to lift up your high and holy name. We also thank you for the opportunity to minister to the young people that you've entrusted to us, whether it is us with our own children or the children that we've been able to go into the highways and the byways and to get and to bring them in. And I pray tonight, Lord, um, as your word goes forth, whether it's here in this pulpit, me preaching, or whether it's those teachers teaching the young people, wherever your word is proclaimed and whoever is within the sound of the voices for proclaiming your word, I pray it would go forth and it would penetrate the hearts and the lives that you intended to touch and to change. We ask you to save the lost, whether it's lost people that may be here, maybe somebody that's watching on Facebook or somebody may be listening by means of radio. I pray that uh, they're lost and need to be saved, that tonight be the night that they'd be willing to hear your word and experience the conviction and the drawing of your Holy Spirit and that they would turn from their sin and repentance and trust in you and be saved. I pray again, as always, Lord, that you would speak to us who's your church, those of us that are saved. And I pray that we would be hearers of your word, receiving what the Spirit of God has to say to us through your word, and that we would receive it, and we'd apply it to our lives, and we'd allow it to change us. And we would leave here different. We'd live here more like you, that we'd leave here closer to you. We'd leave here on fire for you to be about your business. And Lord, I pray that you would help me to preach tonight, that you'd hide me behind the cross, to you give me a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit and the unction from on high to preach your word? And we'll give you the honor and glory for what you do here at Victory Baptist. As you are high and lifted up, we ask you to draw men unto yourself. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The last couple sermons, we've talked about the importance of focusing upon the kingdom of God. Uh, we talked about the fact that following after Jesus is no uh, simple task. In fact, there's some, uh, some expectations of the Lord, if you want to put it that way, that I think it's important for us to realize that God is wanting us to be committed to Him uh, no matter what we think we're going to get out of it. I think that it's important for us to realize that we need to be committed to the work of the ministry, that when we trust in Jesus as our own personal Lord and Savior, that that's exactly what we're doing. We're trusting and depending upon His grace to bring about forgiveness in our life, to give us the assurance of heaven as our home when we leave this world. But folks, we are to live for Him and surrender to Him as our Lord. And I believe that He is to be the one in whom is preeminent one in our own personal lives. When we went and talked about this morning serving as the 70 went out as the Lord commissioned them to do so, to prepare the way in which he was about to go and to share and to do a work. They they were an important role. 
And you and I are important in the role that we have as the people of God, the church of God, ambassadors for Christ, giving the, the, the work or the ministry of reconciliation and giving the word of reconciliation, which we are to go out and share for the lost and dying world. And I want us to see that as Jesus would address this individual that had kind of confronted him and asked him to do something, and between him and his brother to solve some type of, uh, of, of some type of issue that they had amongst themselves, Jesus used it as an opportunity to teach him about what ought to be most important in our life. I want to talk to you about that because in a day in which we live, and it's been this way probably for a long time amongst the, the history of humanity, folks have been driven by some type of riches. They've been driven by some type of material gain. Uh, people are motivated by that. Uh, we are motivated by that in trying, even preparing our children on what is the next steps in their life. And, you know, I, I never forget when time I first went into even kindergarten, and I don't remember a whole lot, but I knew, know, that, that it was always a topic of what did you want to be when you grew up. And most kids would think about different things like police officers or firefighters, something that they, they seen or something they were familiar with. And then, then kids would begin to think about being a doctor or a lawyer or something like that. And it began to go in their mind, I think a lot put in there by their parents as they are trying to, and I understand that probably good intention, but to guide their children in a way in which they would be able to have a very lucrative career in this life especially in our own country, has been pushed in a, in a motivation to achieve what we consider the American dream. And so folks have been chasing after materialism for a long time. And way even before the United States of America and the idea of the American dream, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 and told him that the love of money is the root of all evil. And man will compromise, uh, those who love money will compromise even their, their, their morality, they would do pretty much anything. Those who love money will do anything to gain such. Jesus would say in the Gospels that, that you can't have two masters, that you can't serve mammon or material things and serve God. You either are going to love the one or hate the other. So you can't serve two masters and you need to follow after the one true and living God. Well, folks, the materialism and money and the idea of such is that drives us. I mean, think about our own country. Most folks go to the voting poll, and the sad reality is, what are they voting with? Their pocketbook. And I'm not talking about necessarily that their vote has been bought and paid for literally with money, even though that's a, a real thing. But what I do think is that people are thinking about what is this candidate going to do to help fatten up my pocket? What is the promise that they're making to me? And even those who name the name of Christ, if they're not careful, will put aside Christian values and biblical principles to follow after a dollar. We go about our everyday life. Uh, so many times I've seen over the years of being a saved person that Christians have been guilty of compartmentalizing. On Sunday, it's one thing. On Monday, it's a different thing. And the reason for that is, well, I mean, this is my job. This is what I have to do. This is what, you know, I, I don't really have a choice in the matter. But the reality is, folks, when we are chasing a dollar, when we are consumed with all about money, then we will begin to compromise the things of God if we're not careful. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that as we look here in this passage of Scripture out of the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, beginning in verse 13. You see a little bit how the parable came about. It says there was a, one of the company, there was somebody in the crowd that was around Jesus that thought, you know what, Jesus is a pretty influential person. I mean, he gets a pretty big crowd. And maybe his brother in whom he's about to talk about looks up to Jesus too. I mean, who wouldn't? If you lived in the time in which Jesus walked on the earth, if you were in the area in which he was ministering, I mean, wouldn't you want to go be around him? I mean, everywhere he went, he healed the sick. He, he, he raised the dead. He fed the hungry. He delivered those that were possessed by demons and so on and so forth. I mean, he taught as a man who had authority. Many folks were not accustomed to that. 
He was a man who loved people. He was a man that received the outcast. He was a man that wasn't ashamed to address the rich or the poor, the men or the women. He, he was willing to reach out to all to the children that he take time to let them come into his lap. You know, we, we find that Jesus was a man that no doubt, even though his appearance initially wouldn't be that soon somebody would be attracted to, as Isaiah 53 says, we do know that the crowd would come around him. And so here's this individual amongst the crowd. And as he's there amongst the crowd, he comes to Jesus and he says, Master, would you do me a favor? Speak to my brother and tell him to give me some of that inheritance. Sounds like a decent request. I mean, the man, I don't know exactly the context. Jesus, of course, he's God. He knows all things, but the man doesn't seem to explain the context. This could have been a, a similar situation to, to the prodigal son. There could have been already a division amongst the inheritance, and this brother could have already squandered his inheritance away while the other brother seemed to be a little better steward of what he had, and maybe this brother over here wanted more. Or maybe it was the elder brother who maybe got a double portion and the younger brother was covetous of what his brother had and what he did not have, he was upset about. And so he is trying to get Jesus. The Christian thing to do would be to give to those what you got, right? I mean, that's what people think. But Jesus uses this opportunity. And I think it's important for us to be reminded from time to time about what's most important especially as we're doing ministry, as we're committed to the Lord Jesus. He says this unto him, man, <laughs> I kind of like the translation. It's old English, it's the King James translation, but it sounds like just down-to-earth type response to me. You know, he says, man, you know, I could just hear a little bit of inflection in Jesus' voice as he would say, man, who made me the judge or a divider over you two? You know, what are you talking about, man? Why do I have to address that? And he says this, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things in which he possesses. He said, why do we need to be addressed by this, Brother Anthony, especially when we're talking about ministry over the last, you know, couple sermons that you've preached? Because a lot of times folks are lacking in their commitment to the ministry because they are chasing a dollar more than they are committed to the lordship of Jesus. We, we are so consumed with what time we have in trying to ob ob uh, obtain possessions instead of being good stewards of the time that God's given us to be about his business. And so Jesus reminds this individual, and we need to be reminded today, not just as a church, but people as in, in general, you need to be careful of covetousness. You need to be careful of desiring what someone else has. This is something that's been worn throughout the scripture that man should not have a covetous type heart. We should not be looking at what our neighbor has and desiring what they have. We need to be content in where we are. He says, because a man's life is not, it, it does not consist of the things in which he has. It's not about the abundance of your possessions. You know, even today, even today, we look around and we say, man, that person right there is blessed. Why? Because they have a big home. Because they've got several cars. Because they've got a lot of money. Because they've got nice clothes. That person there is blessed. And my question is sometimes, are they really? You know, because the reality is every good gift comes down from the Father of lights. But what makes what they have necessarily good? Because just like Jesus says that it's easier for a camel to get to the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man entering into heaven. You know why? Because of the much possessions that they have. Just like the young rich ruler that came to Jesus and said, Good Master, what must I do to in inherit eternal life? And he said, we'll keep the commandments. And he says, well, I've done that for my youth up. And he says, well, you just lack this one thing. Sell all that you got, give it to the poor, and come follow after me. And the young rich ruler at that time turned away, left upset because he hadn't much. Here's an individual from the outside looking in, appeared to be very blessed, 
And it seemed to be that the favor of God was upon him. But when he, was, when he asked the question of Jesus, what must it do to receive eternal life? Jesus told him, what was he telling him? He wasn't saying that necessarily selling his goods and giving it to the poor earned him a place in heaven. But what Jesus knew is exactly that the idol that this man had was all of his possessions. And Jesus needed to be the Lord of his life. And the reality was that young rich ruler didn't keep the Ten Commandments his whole life because the very first one he was guilty of breaking. He had set up an idol. He had other gods before the Lord. It was all his material things. And Jesus was telling him to repent thereof of his sin and to follow after him. So just because somebody has riches doesn't make them necessary, necessarily blessed of Almighty God. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't bless folks financially. He does. He does for the friends of his kingdom. To who is given much, much is required. And God does not bless for the sake of us just to hoard it up, but instead to be tools and instruments in his hands to give back. And that's a reality no matter how much you've got. So we got to understand that a man's life does not consist of the abundance of things that he possesses. That doesn't make him more of a man or more of a person than the next person down the road who may not have anything. We look at folks and we think, man, that person's better than me because they have this or they have that. No. You know what I found? I found that some of the people that we think are the worst off have, have treated me with more respect than a lot of folks who who you would think you would give respect. With some folks who think because what they've got, they don't need God. But folks, today I want us to see how important it is for us to have the right perspective and to understand that Jesus is to be the Lord of our life. And this parable, it helps remind us. He says here that as Jesus spoke to, this, to these people, he spoke a parable, a real kind of life story that uh, has biblical truths. He says, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? I could just hear what some of y'all are probably thinking. You're not saying it out loud, but you probably have thought it. I like to have that problem. What am I going to do with everything I got? Huh? I mean, what a problem to have, right? I mean, I don't know where to put all of my possessions. I don't know where to put all the things that I've got. I don't have enough room in my bank account to stick all my money. I mean, what a problem to have, right? Well, this individual, uh, we find that was so consumed, just like today, that those that have such an abundance, what are they concerned with? Getting more than what they already have. We're not careful. We're consumed by those things. You know, it's amazing to me in the way that folks with abundance, all they're concerned about is how they can hang on to it. When I believe that we who are serving the Lord need to realize that God's given us what he's given us for the furtherance of the gospel. And that means whether you as an individual or us as a church. You know, one thing that I think about and over the years that I've been in the ministry, that every church that I've pastored, is what I've thought. I've thought the things that we have are to be used for the furtherance of the gospel, however that is. When I came here and you all were letting uh, London Christian Academy use the facility for their uh, basketball team and so on and so forth, I thought, you know what? That's a pretty awesome thing. That's a pretty awesome thing to allow the facility to be used for other folks that, that are the Christian folks that are doing things like the Christian school. I think that's a pretty awesome idea. And I think it's a pretty cool thing to see that happen. thing that I've done over the years is when I had access, especially the last church I pastored, we had several vans. And I remember New Salem Baptist from over here calling me, and I didn't know who they were. They didn't, I, I guess they knew who I was, but I knew who they were. And they said, we're going to a mission trip down to Cleveland, Tennessee, and we've tried to rent some vans to go down there, and we have, can't find them anywhere. There's nowhere to rent a van to take, and we need a few vans to go down there and, and to be able to spread the gospel on our, our annual mission trip that we go down there and I said, well, sure. They said, well, how much is it going to cost? I said, it's not going to cost you anything. I said, I'll make sure that's got oil change. I'll make sure that there's gas that's in it. I said, if you want to fill it up, maybe when you come back, that'd be great. You know, if not, no big deal. But we'll, we'll let you use the facility. You know what I didn't have? I didn't have a business meeting to do that either. I didn't even go and ask anybody else. I just said, hey, 
go ahead, come on, we'll get the keys. I told my secretary, make sure if somebody shows up to get these vans, let them have some. What for? I said, because we're going to help share the gospel. Well, how are we going to do that? We're going to give them the, the vehicle to get down there to share the gospel. That's what we're going to do. You know, there's been several times over the years that we're going to do missionary things that, that whether we go do it ourselves or whether we help contribute financially, whatever it is, we need to see that the abundance of things in which we have should not consume us in such a way on thinking how we are to keep it or get more or how we're going to preserve it, but instead we need to have the mentality, why has God blessed me or blessed us with such, and how can it be used for the furtherance of the gospel, folks? We have to think about that. We have to think on that mindset. We, do not have to, we should not have the mindset of the brother that came to Jesus or this man that was in the parable. We should not be, have the mindset of the covetous brother thinking, what can I get from my brother that I don't already have? Or we should not be like the man that Jesus spoke of in the parable who had so much, but he was more concerned with having more place to store what he had than be able to use what he had for the glory of God. He said, he said, this is what I will do. I'm going to pull down my barns. I'm going to tear down my barns. And I'm going to build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. Folks, we, we need to see that God has called us to be stewards. I, I remember the parable that Jesus spoke of the man who gave certain talents to. And I don't remember exactly off the top of my head the amount of talents, but I know that one had like 10, one had like five, maybe one had one. And they were went about to go and come back with more talents than what they started out with. And the one that had the one talent went and buried that talent. And then the others went about and multiplied what they had. And when the master came back and asked them what they did with the talents, those showed how they had invested and how they had a return. And then the one that just had the one went and got it that they had buried and brought it back and said, here, this is what I've got. And the Lord said, what did you do? They said, we just buried it. And someone said, well, that's a good steward. A penny saves, a penny earned. You save that talent. And the Lord said, you know what? He took it from this one and gave it to the one that had more, a lot more. And some would say, why? Because you know what that person did? Instead of using what they had for the kingdom of God, for the furtherance of the gospel, for it to grow, what we find is that they were too consumed with hanging on to it, too worried about it. You know what the church does too much? Try to hang on to what we got. When we are so consumed with what we do have, I've seen it, and I'm not talking about what the money is in the bank account. You know, I have pastor places and, and what, they're, what they're more concerned about more than anything. And listen, I, I don't have a problem taking care of what we got. We need to. You know, we need to take care of it. In fact, we, we need to do some renovation here on some things. You know, I don't have a problem with that. But this is what I do have a problem with. There's one we are more concerned about if somebody's going to walk by and scratch the wall or somebody is going to get something dirty or somebody's going to do this more than it is being thankful for the fact that we got somebody here to scratch the wall. Well, we got someone to come in and make the floor dirty. Uh, it's almost, it's, it's almost as very heartbreaking to me. I don't know how many times those same folks say they want to get in a fuss or a fight or an argument over trying to preserve a facility. Remember when we named the facility that we built, the last church I pastored, it's called the Outreach Center. I don't know what they wanted to call it when they started building. It was in the process before I got there. The floor was already poured. But when we got everything finished, we're going to call it the Outreach Center. And he said, why? I said, because we're going to use it for outreach. I said, okay, what's that mean? I said, that means it's going to get used. Not just on homecoming. We didn't build a big building. We spent half a million dollars so we can have a place to eat on homecoming once a year. That's about the foolish thing I ever heard of. Hello? Uh, Hello? I mean, some of the things that we think about, some of the things we think are important aren't all that important, folks. 
Do I like homecoming? Yes, it's coming up at the end of the month. Do I think we ought to have a big crowd? Yes. You think you got work to do between now and then to get folks here? Yes, absolutely. We've got a lot of work to do. Homecoming is a good thing to be able to come home and to worship together and, and to see folks we haven't seen or maybe be a motivator to get some folks back who have been out for whatever reason. And should we have a time of fellowship? Sure. Should we have a great meal? Sure. So come ready and cook. Amen. Hello. I'm ready. I mean, I've been dieting. If you can't tell, I've lost about 15 pounds. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to lose some more. I'm going to keep on going. But guess what? I'm going to lose enough so I can eat good, too. You know? But I say all that to say that a lot of times what we are, we do something out, out of a, a, a complete messed up thinking. I remember making a statement from a pulpit. I said, I don't care. Tear the place down. Oh, my goodness, some people got their feathers ruffled over that. The only thing they heard was saying that you don't care if they tear the place down. That wasn't my point at all. My point wasn't that the facility ought to be mistreated. No, but my point was I'd rather the place be torn down with folks that are here than have some Taj Mahal with no one in it. It doesn't make any sense. No. Jesus has talked to these folks and said, the abundance of things you have or your life does not consist of the abundance of things that you possess. And the person that was here that he was speaking of had all this abundance in such a way that he could just tear down what he already had. And then he built bigger so he had more storage. Folks, we have what we have for the furtherance of the gospel. That's what we've got. Whether it's the money in the bank, well, it's the facility that we already have. One of the things that intrigued me when I came here to Victory Baptist Church is I walked around this place by myself several times. Before I was ever the pastor, before I ever knew God was going to call me to be your pastor, when I was just here to fill in and preach for you all while y'all was in the process of looking for a pastor, I walked around here, I drove out here, and I drove back, and I looked around here, and I seen the land, I seen the facility, and I said, you know what? There's some potential here. There's a great opportunity to try to reach people with the gospel. We're, we're in a pretty good location. We're in a county with a lot of people. You all have got a, a nice facility here is what I thought about when I came. I said, man, there's, th this is a great opportunity. But we've got to take advantage of what God's given us and do it and use it. We, got, we, can't, we can't think that Oh, well, we're just gonna, we're gonna hang on to what we got or we're just going to, you know. No, that's not what it's about. Folks, if it was just about us meeting together for worship, we could go and set up a tent somewhere and sit under that every week and not have to worry about nothing else. But folks, we are to use what God's given us for the furtherance of the gospel. Not to hoard up, not to be consumed by it, but instead say, God, you know what? You have blessed us, you have given us, and you said to us plainly, it's more blessed for those to give than it is to receive. So I think about, man, what an opportunity we have. We don't want to make sure we get caught up in the mentality of this guy. I'm going to pull down my barns. I'm going to build greater so I can bestow all my fruits and my goods there. We also got to be careful of this mentality. He says, I will say to my soul, soul that has much goods laid up for many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. We got to make sure that we guard against the fact of thinking that we have arrived somewhere. That's one thing that, that's kind of scary as a pastor when, when folks become content, you know. Like I told you, somebody from the KBC called me the other day and they were just talking about I don't know. Well, they must have looked at some of the numbers, whatever was turned in. I don't know exactly what even motivated the call, to be honest with you. The man called me. He talked about what was going on. And like I said, I thought to myself, and I told him, I said, man, we're far from where we need to be. Far from it. And I said, the reality is, I don't know if I'll ever be content. There'll never be a place that I think as pastor, that, man, we're, we're where we need to be. You know what? Now, there's 500 people that showed up next Sunday. Guess what? That won't be enough. That won't be enough. You say, man, where where we sit them? I don't know. That would be, be a good problem to have, right? 
And when you get that place and you're able to hold that many, guess what? You can't stop there. You got to keep going. You know why? Because there's a whole lot more people out there that's lost and in their sin. There's still a lot of people out there that, that we need to reach with the gospel of Christ. And we need to be able to do whatever it takes to reach them with the gospel of Christ. We cannot grow content. We have to continue to push forward. We cannot say to ourselves, hey, you have much good. You have accomplished much. You have, you're, you're fine where you're at now. Let's just take it easy. Let's eat. Let's drink. Let's be merry. Let's just be content with where we're at. We can't, we can't get to that point, you know? I think that's one reason why the church has struggled over the years in America. We have grown content. We've grown comfortable. We have, we have thought, you know what? We do enough to get by. Or we say this, if we're not, if we're content, we don't know what to do. We say things, well, everybody's baptisms are down. Well, attendance everywhere is down. I mean, it's a struggle everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, but I don't see how that should make us feel better. Hello? We ought to feel all the worse. I mean, if everybody's down in baptism and everybody's down in attendance, I mean, don't you think that that ought to cause us to say, hey, something's wrong with what we're doing? You know what the problem is with most? We have went from the great commission of go and tell, doing what Jesus said. You go to the highways, you go to the byways, you go to the hedges, you compel folks to come in so my house will be full. You know what we've done? We have flipped that and we thought, well, as long as we're here and the doors are open, they can come. I'll tell you what, we've got far away from that. We don't even do that anymore. We just say, hey, flip on your computer. Find us on Facebook. Find us on YouTube. Stay where you're at. You don't even have to come here. We don't go and tell. We don't even flip the doors and lights on and say, come on in. No. Now it's like, I mean, it's getting easier and easier for us. We've grown more and more content. Folks, we got to be about the work of the Lord's business. When we can't grow content, we can't have that mentality that, hey, man, this is good. You know, I, I, I mean, this is kind of weird. This is probably just purely a, uh, a human thing. It's nothing. It's not spiritual, so I'm not saying that, okay? Don't hear me say it's spiritual. I'm going to tell you what I think sometimes. But I'm going to tell you what you have to guard against. When, when the church is struggling, I told you this morning, we was at $400 or something when I first came here in the bank. And I remember it wasn't a couple months later, we had a crazy electric bill. We had all kinds of problems going on. This heat was on, that air was on, things were this way and that way, and we didn't know how to use them thermostats. I mean, it was whacked out. I mean, the electric bill was outrageous. I mean, we was able to pay the bill, and it was just a miracle that we was able to pay the bill. I remember it. And you say, man, that's a struggle. When you start talking about that and preaching about that and you see people that, that say, hey, you know what? I need to start doing my part. I need to start tithing. I need to start giving like I'm supposed to. And you start seeing that and you see God bless it. If you're not careful, though, what happens is when you're out of that rut, when you're out of that hole, when you see God move, you're not careful. All of a sudden, people start thinking, I don't have to do as much. No, folks, we have to stay consistent. We need to continue to do what we're supposed to do of giving of our tithes, our offerings, our times, our talents, everything. I'm not just talking about money here. I'm talking about everything that we do. I remember one time some fellow told me, uh, I said, man, you need to come back to Sunday school. He said, well, I've been to Sunday school all my life. I said, what are you talking about? I've been pastoring here for how many years you ain't been to Sunday school? Oh, I put my time in already. I'm like, what? What are you talking about, man? I was 30 years. And yeah, but you, you're 70 now. So what you done for the last 40 years? I put my time in already. At one time, they used to do them Sunday school pens. If you didn't miss a day, you'd get a pen at the end of the year, and you had perfect attendance. And man, there's some people, man, they didn't miss a day. And I, I don't have a problem with that. I, mean, I don't have a problem with a little motivation, but they, they didn't miss. And then all of a sudden, when the pens weren't that a big deal anymore, like they dropped off the face, face of the earth. I didn't get my pen. I ain't showing up. Like, well, I guess... The pen was what motivated you. 
you know. Now, folks think they've arrived. They think they've arrived. They think we're not careful. I've been saved for, you know, right now I've been saved for 23 years. This past September 20th was 23 years. It's coming January 3rd. I've been called to preach 23 years. And then I think maybe March or something, I've been pastoring 20 years, something like that, 19 or 20 years. Some of y'all a lot longer than that than me. But is there a time where we say, I'm where I need to be? Is there a time where we say, I put in all the years I need to really worry about? I'll tell you what the mentality is. This retirement, this retirement mentality of America, I'm good with it. You want to quit working? You can quit working? Fine. You can go home and rest and and not have to worry about a, a secular job and you're able to retire and you can live off what you're retirement. That's good. But I'm going to tell you what ain't part of the plan of God. Retiring from his work, folks. It's not. It's amazing. I watched it. I watched it throughout the ministry. I watched folks get older. They decide, man, I'm retiring my secular job. Man, they're gone three, four, five, six months out of the year. It's amazing to me, too. They're gone six months out of the year, and they show back up on church six months later like they just right back in where things need to be. I'm like, hold up. Don't come back in here telling me what you think we ought to be doing. You ain't been here six months. Hello? And not even think one bit about it at all. In fact, think they pretty spiritual about it. No. You ain't retiring from the things of God, folks. That's right. That's why I work Susie death. Huh? I mean, you get opportunity to, to do more for the Lord. That's what we need to do. We don't get content in ourselves where we say, soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. It's time to take it easy. We don't say, soul, you know what? It's time for us to just be on easy street. No. Jesus said, you better seize the day. You better take care of the time. You better work while it's still day because the, the days are evil. Night's coming. We better get to it while we can get to it, folks. We need to understand that we don't need to be chasing the possession of material things. We don't need to quit before our time is to quit. We also need to be aware of the fact that, you know what? We're going to be given account before God sooner than what we think. It says, God said unto him, thou fool. This guy thought he had it all figured out. Have you ever been there? Have you ever thought you had it all figured out? You thought you had all your finances figured out. You've been doing everything. And then all of a sudden, something happens, and it's like, I can't never get ahead. You take three steps forward, take five steps back. You know? I mean, I've learned over the years, you know what you got to do? You just need to be committed to the Lord, do what he tells you to do, and let him take care of all of it. That's all you can do. It's the only thing that makes sense, too. But you get out here in the world, look at this man. He had so much stuff that he tore down his old barns that he had. He built bigger barns. He put all his stuff in the new things. He decided it's time for him to kick back, relax, take it easy. He's going to eat, he's going to drink, he's going to be merry, and he's just going to chill the rest of his life. And the Lord said, you're a fool because tonight your soul is required of thee. We go about living life as if we're going to live forever here. And that's not going to happen, folks. Not here. It's not going to happen. You're going to live forever or you're going to die forever. That's what's going to happen. You ain't going to live forever because you have trusted in Jesus or you're going to die forever in the lake of fire, which is the second death. But in this old world here, Jesus, Terry, like I said this morning, you're not getting out of here alive. And we have an appointment with death, and life is short, and we don't know when that appointment is supposed to come, and we've just got to be prepared for it. And you see people all the time thinking that they're going to do this, they're going to do that. You know? You know, I, I mean, it's, it's really sad sometimes. I've watched people, they, they kill themselves, all their, 
life. They neglect things they don't need to neglect. I watch parents all talking about them, take care of my kids, and all they do is work, 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 and they don't see their kids grow up. They ain't a part of what their kids are doing, and then all of a sudden they're grown, and they think, man, it's time for I can re retire, I can take care of them, and then all of a sudden they're sick with something. Soon as they think they've got it all figured out and under control, you know what? Remind, life reminds us that we ain't in control. And we have messed up all the way through. Folks, we need to understand that as Christians, our responsibility is to serve the Lord Jesus according to his word, period. Period. Whatever gifts he's given you, whatever talents he's given you, wherever he's placed you in life, in your secular job, whatever, he has a plan. And all those things correspond with the furtherance of the gospel and how you who are saved are supposed to be his ambassadors. You're supposed to be his mouthpiece. You're supposed to be his ministers. And how that we come together collectively as a spiritual body of Christ to combine our talents, our resources under the head of Jesus, go out here and make a difference. It's like those 70 did. We are to go out here together. Because you know what? We don't know when our time's up. We don't know when our time's up. You know, people say, well, man, when I, when I get, when I just get a few things done, I'll, I'll do more for the Lord. When is enough? It's never enough. That's why Jesus said earlier to the person, well, let me go bury my father first. You, you let the dead bury the dead. And you go preach the gospel. Well, let me say goodbye to those that are at my house. He said, no, because a man who has grabbed a hold of the plow and turns back is not fit for the kingdom of God. He said, excuse after excuse after excuse. And guess what? It's that easy to come up with another excuse. It's like missing worship service. I mean, if you miss next week, it's going to be easier for you to miss next week. And it's harder to come back for some reason. I don't know why that is, but that's how it works. We come up with excuse after excuse after excuse. I know, you know why? Because, I mean, I'm a pastor and I've battled with excuses. Hello? Let me let y'all in on a little secret. Every time I've showed up to preach, I mean, I always wanted to. Hello? I've been right in the bed on Sunday afternoon thinking, man, It'd be a whole lot better just to be staying in this bed right here. And the Lord had reached down there and smacked me like, what? Get up. Get up. You know, get up and get about what you're supposed to be doing. You know, I mean, that, that is the reality. We all have these battles, these struggles, but, but when we think that, that it's about us, and us getting to where we want to be so we can do what we want to do, we have completely misunderstood when Jesus said, whom the Son makes free is free indeed, or the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. God's never said that my freedom should be abused to do whatever you want to do, or the liberty in the Lord is so something for a license for you to do whatever you want, and that you, you just, you know, you can be committed to the Lord however you want to. You have freedom in Him. I'm saved by grace, Brother Anthony. That's what you teach, and that's what I believe. Well, I'm kept by grace, Brother Anthony, and that's what you teach, and that's what I believe. But I don't ever believe the fact that because we are saved by grace and kept by grace, that means that you and I have the liberty to do whatever we want to in regards to the one who saved us by his grace. We're to follow him. We're to serve him. We're to die to ourselves, and Christ is to live through us. The church has been consumed with, especially in America, the American dream. We have set up that idol. And, and if you want to say if there's anything positive about what's going on in our world today, I, I think there's a few things that are positive. And one, I think it lets us know again how frail life is. I think number two, I think it lets us know how quick the things we thought that we were gaining all these years could be gone just like that. And I think it reminds us that, hey, 
the, the, the freedoms that we have to come and to go and do what we please and to worship when we want, to show up. You know what? That could be taken away just like that too. We better get serious about our, our, our commitment to the Lord Jesus. Realizing at the end of the day, that's only, that really matters. That's the only thing. It's only that has real eternal value. You know? The rest of this world here is a mess. The rest of this world is, is one day going to burn up, but the things of God are the only things that are going to be for eternal. He says to this guy, you're a fool tonight. Thy soul shall be required of thee. And he said, then whose shall those things be which you have provided? Who's going to get all that stuff? Most people just create problems for the next group. Isn't that what the whole debate and the reason the parable came about in the first place? A brother comes to Jesus, hey, do me a favor. Tell my brother, give me some of what he's got. Jesus says, man, man, who made me the divider of your stuff? You know, he gets down to the end of this parable and he says, fool, you're worried about things that your soul is going to be required of thee, and then what are you going to do with the stuff you got? Because naked you came in this world, and naked you're going to leave this world. From the dust you came, from the dust you shall return. And as the preacher said in the past, you don't see, you don't see a U-Haul following the hearse. Now, maybe the pharaohs back in Egypt thought they built the big pyramids and made these big old tombs and put all their treasure in there, but how stupid, amen? How foolish to think they had everything ready for the next life. Ain't a gold bar one help them when they open their eyes in torment. Hello? And I tell you what, not only were they foolish to think that, I don't know if they are more foolish than the people that thought they better stay out of the tomb. If I was a born-again believer back in that day, I wouldn't be worried about no curse of Pharaoh. I went there and got me a little bit of that gold change. Hello? I mean, think about this, folks. What in the world are we, what are we doing today? If we're not careful, we are driven. We are, that, that, that's exactly why right now our society is in a mess. Because we have been manipulated by fear of our health and our wealth. You say, how is that? Well, we're afraid of our, our situation of our health. What do we do? We went right to our homes like they said. Worried about our wealth? We were content with them sending us Stimulus check, stimulus check. And they're still talking about it more. You know? I mean, they're still talking about it. It's pretty amazing to me. You know, what's going on in our world? But guess what, folks? Following that dollar. Self-preservation is, is pushing us along. We've got a responsibility to follow Jesus and put him first. Not be consumed by the money. Not being consumed by those such things. No, as, as a church, we need to be consumed by being committed to the furtherance of the gospel, being the spiritual body of Jesus, continuing on his work in which he left for us to do and allow him to show out and to take care of us and to do what he wants to do through our lives. Let him do his work. You know, what about you today? Where's your commitment to the Lord Jesus? What drives you? Where are you at today personally? If you've never trusted Jesus as your own personal Lord and Savior, today's the day of salvation for you. Now is the accepted time for you to turn from your sin. We are all sinners and I'm sure of the glory of God. Turn from that sin, repent. I mean, just turn around, make an about face. You're going one direction, turn around, look to Jesus and cry out to him. Confess to him that you're a sinner. Confess to him that you believe that he is God who became a man for you, who died on the cross for you, who rose again for you, overcoming your sin. And tell him that you need forgiveness. Tell him you want him in your life. Tell him you're willing to commit yourself to him and let him pull you out of the horrible pit in the miry clay, save your soul and give you a purpose. 
For us who are saved, no. Let's really evaluate, is Jesus the Lord of our life? Is he the Lord? No. Are, are we like this fellow here, worrying about what we've got here, here in this earth? I think there's a lot of what goes on, and I think that's a lot of why we are not being used of God like we could be. What about you tonight? As the Lord spoke to your heart, how do you respond to him? There's Brother Jamie to come, and those are going to help with the invitation, and as they make their way, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we bow before you tonight, thanking you again for your word. We're thankful for the reminder, Lord, that that really the things that we try to hang on to, the things that we try to earn, the things in which we think bring us security or stability, and those things are nothing but shifting sand. You know, Proverbs said and many times it's like us putting money in a bag with holes or a bag that has wings and flies off. Lord, so many times we are so consumed individually as a church. We, we get so consumed pursuing that stuff instead of realizing that, you know what? We need to pursue you. We need to be about your business. You take care of the needs that we have. You, in, in fact, I mean, most folks can testify that, that, Lord, you don't just meet our needs. You always are far above more than what we could ever think or imagine. And Lord Jesus, you bless us so we can be a blessing to others and to glorify you. So Lord, I just pray that as you spoke to our hearts that we'd respond to you tonight and be obedient to you. And we give you the honor and glory for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.